So what you're saying is when you look at Genesis 1 through 11, for example, you see that as real history. Is that correct? That's correct because the rest of the Old Testament does, the prophets do, the Law of Moses does, the New Testament writers of gospel, epistle, all see it as serious history and that it is the foundation of fall, redemption, and consummation. What about the passages that we see in, in Romans when, mm -hmm. when, when Paul is writing, in mm -hmm. the six through eight in particular, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, about Adam yeah. and his, uh, his addressing the notion of what happened at the fall through right. Adam. That's another example, is it not? Very much so central to the plan of salvation would be the two Adams, first Adam and last Adam. Romans 5, 12 to 21, and then certain passages in 1 Corinthians 15, the great resurrection chapter. You know, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So in Romans 5, 12 to 21, you have a comparison and contrast. The first Adam disobeyed. Everybody was in the first Adam, as all the believers will be in the last Adam. And it's covenantal headship, as the first Adam was the head of all who are descending from him. So the last Adam is the head of all who will ever be united to him by faith in the Holy Spirit. That is the elect. What the first Adam did affected directly the lives of all his people to the end of time. What the last Adam did affects directly the lives of his people to the end of time. The great Scottish preacher, rural pastor, tremendous intellectual, great Hebraist, Thomas Boston is discussing the contrast between the two Adams, first Adam and last Adam. And he says, you could bring up a moral issue, an ethical issue and say, wasn't it unfair that we're born into a fallen race as Romans 5, 12 to 21 clearly teaches because of what our ancestor did, our representative in the covenant, namely Adam. That's why we get sick and die. How fair is that? And then he said, yes, it's fair because it's who we really are. He had his children after he had fallen. They carry his corrupted nature. But we gain far more than we lose because the last Adam represents us in the covenant. As by one man, sin entered the world and sin brought guilt and death. So by one man, there's righteousness of God his obedience and forgiveness and life eternal. So he says, what we gain, if we're willing to believe in Christ, in him as the last Adam is so massively more than what we lose in being connected to the first Adam. Let's be grateful for the principle of representation that you have in Romans 5, 12 to 21 and 1 Corinthians 15. So that's quite crucial to the two representatives of the human race. But one of the key questions that is asked there is that if death came as a result of the consequence of the fall, as God mm -hmm. promised it would, mm -hmm. does that mean that there was no death before? And what are the implications of that in terms of the conventional paradigm that we, mm -hmm. we see today? That certainly means it. Again, refer to Dr. Nigel Cameron, his book, Evolution and the Authority of the Bible, says one of the major reasons evolution could not have occurred is because there was no death in the universe prior to Adam's disobedience of God, which uh, the consequences of that would be uh, judgment, disintegration, and death, as we see from Genesis chapter 3 and also Romans 5. 12 to 21, and also 1 Corinthians 15, not to mention some other places. So no, there was no death, um, many would argue. There had to be death because nature is balanced today by death. That's true. But in the new heavens and the new earth, in paradise, there won't be any death, and the nature will be beautifully balanced. As it will be balanced in heaven, in the new heavens and the new earth, in the paradise to come, without sin, wickedness, disintegration, and death. So it's balanced before the fall. So therefore, evolution could not have occurred without nature red in tooth and claw. 
without fighting, without death. That could not have happened before the fall of Adam. Therefore, he is not an evolved being. That's a clear from the central theology of Scripture, and there's no way around it if you accept the authority of God. Now, is this a key issue then uh, to be expressed uh, with someone who holds to what is called theistic evolutionists? I think it certainly should be shown where they're not following faithfully Scripture as the humble servants of the Lord are called to do. So there's, there is an acceptance of the theory of evolution, uh, but somehow that theory has to have a great deal of death and turmoil mm. before we get to the first Adam. Yes, you have to evacuate the causality that Genesis 3 and Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15 attribute to the choice of Adam to sin and that death came from that. You have to evacuate that. You have to remove a good part of the authority of Scripture when it speaks of the causality of death in order to accommodate a theory that came from the secularist. And it's not worth the price you would pay.